In the early days of 1849, when the gold rush was on in California, an eastern miner crossed the continent to seek his fortune in California. And he struck it rich very soon after he came here. Immediately he wrote to his wife in the east, it was time to come with their young son, eight-year-old son, join him here in California. So the wife took passage on a boat leaving New York for San Francisco. That's how they used to do it. It took days to go around the Cape Horn, the southern tip of South America. The voyage was very favorable until they got to the, to the Cape Horn. And when they neared the Cape, there was a terrible storm arose and the ship was breaking up and Finally, the passengers and crew were ordered to get into lifeboats. As the ship was about to sink, for some reason, the mother and the eight-year-old son were down below deck. And uh, something detained them there. So they came rushing to the deck, and the last lifeboat was leaving. Soon she discovered the lifeboats were filled to capacity, with only one place left room only for one person. As the mother stood there, it was a choice between her and her little boy. She didn't hesitate. She kissed her son, dropped him into a place of safety, and as she did so, she said, my boy, when you see your father, tell him mother died for you. And she went down with the ship. What a mother's heart of pure gold. That's really gracious, isn't it? That's grace. And yet, that's exactly what we'd expect from a mother, right? Exactly what we'd expect. Such a feeble illustration, really, when you compare the big picture to the grace of God and what he's done for all of us. Here's the real thing. Romans 5, verse 10. Romans chapter 5 and verse 10. <clears throat> Romans 5 verse 10. For if when we were enemies, what? Enemies, right? For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be, what does the next word say? Saved, Saved by his life. Wow, what an idea. John Bunyan wrote a book entitled Pilgrim's Progress. How many of you have read that book or parts of it? Yeah, it's, a, it's really a must read if you haven't read it. John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, it was written from jail. He was separated from his family, so he couldn't support them because of his faith in Jesus and his proclamation of this wonderful thing we're talking about called salvation. But he also wrote other books. One of them is entitled Grace Abounding. It's the title of our study today, Grace Abounding, another must read if you haven't read it. He describes a grace so deep that even the deepest and blackest of sins are not beyond its reach, beyond the reach of grace. A grace so high that it reaches to the very mercy seat in the throne room of heaven. And that throne is a lamb, according to Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6 a lamb as it were freshly slain, in the mercy seat, in the, in the throne room. That grace is so wide that it removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. Now, Titus 2, verse 11. This was in our scripture reading this morning. Titus 2, verse 11. A little book here right after Timothy and Thessalonians. Titus 2, verse 11. It says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. What is the grace of God, by the way, that has come to all men? It's the gospel, isn't it? It's the glorious gospel. It says, for the grace of God that brings salvation to all, salvation has appeared to all men. How many men? 
All men have, have been affected by this. All men. When Moses asked God to tell him his, him his name, God answered. The Lord God, merciful. And uh, does somebody know what the next one is? Gracious, filled with grace, okay? Gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. That's in Exodus 34, 6. Earlier on at the, at the burning bush, Moses asked God, who shall I tell Pharaoh has sent me to you? Who should I tell him? And God answered, tell him, I am sent you. I, I am sent you. I am. You know what? He's always there. I say to Adrena today and Jamar and Gidget and Lloyd, the great I am is always there. Past, present, and future. God is abundant in goodness and truth. Then as he is today, and today as he was then, when God does something in your life, it's already, it's already in the past. As he was, he will be in all of your future. He's the past and the present and the future. He's the great I am. In fact, all who will enter that heavenly place of rest will be there because of grace abounding, abundant. Not a single person will be there because he is saved by his works, but by mercy and grace alone. Some teach that in the Old Testament, the Old Testament people were saved by keeping the law. But that now we are New Testament Christians, right? We're somehow separated from the law. Saved by grace now. If this, if this were true, that in the Old Testament people were saved by their good works, and in the New Testament they're saved by grace alone, then men and women who lived before the cross would have been able to save themselves by their performance, right? While those who live after the cross find themselves powerless to meet the obligations of God's law. What says the Bible? Let's turn to Romans chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. Romans chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. Romans 4 is a wonderful chapter. I'd recommend it for a Sabbath afternoon read. Romans 4, let's start with verse 2. Look at these two Old Testament characters. Wow. Abraham and David. For if Abraham were justified by works... He has whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was, what does it say next? Counted. Counted to him for righteousness. Reckoned to him for righteousness. Considered to him for righteousness. God considered him righteous because of his faith, right? Now to him that, now to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Why would, it, why would our works be reckoned as debt? Because our works, no matter how good they are, never reach the high bar. But Jesus did, right? In him was no sin. Now verse 5. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is what? Counted for righteousness. He says it several times here. And then verse 6. Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness without works. We're accepted because of our faith in somebody who had been before us, right? He's the forerunner of our faith. As it was with those Old Testament characters, Abraham and David, so it is with us. All who enter heaven are there for only one reason. That is because of Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death and his saving merit, and his deep love for humans. That's why we'll be there. We've got to all be there, right? Don't let any of us be absent from, on that day. His death pays the penalty for sin. Blood was shed. He's my substitute. The Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. death. Somebody took my place. If we're to live to, lived for forever, somebody has to die, right? Either us, forever, or what? 
or Jesus took our place. What an idea. And his perfect life is my righteousness. That does reach the high bar. And when I give my heart to Jesus and, and become and are in Christ, he looks at me as though I had never sinned, as though I had spoke like he spoke, as though I had lived like he lived. Isn't that neat? Given to every believer is a gift. His merit, his righteous life is my title to heaven. Acts 4, verse 12. Some of us could say this by memory. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. This is a wonderful, wonderful text. This is one to remember, one that you'll use as you're witnessing to others. Verse 12 says, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, whereby we must be saved. Wow, it's all about Jesus. None of this is about us. However, the fact that all Old Testament and New Testament Christians, all of them, who are saved by grace through faith alone, it does not dispense with the law of God anymore in the New Testament as in the Old Testament. The law is still there, right? We're saved from the penalty of that law. You know, the law changes its relationship to us when we give our hearts to Jesus. The law was our enemy before, right? It condemns us, condemns us to die. But the law points us to Jesus. And when we've given our hearts to Jesus, we have a new relationship to the law now, don't we? The law now is our friend. Deuteronomy 6 says, it's, it's, it is, was given for our good always. The law is not against grace, and grace is not against the law. The Bible says, do we then make Void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we what? Establish the law. The church of Jesus considers the law very important. The character of Jesus is the law. That's what his law, that's what his character was like. He would never think of lying to you or uh, killing you. Ah, he came here to let, make us live, right? He'd never think of stealing to you. That's how he loves us. It's a transcript of God's character. He's the one who extends grace to us. It is he who wrote the law on tables of stone, showing its immutability, its long-lasting, its forever. All, all good men in the Bible have, 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 have counted God's law as a friend, the psalmist said, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. And then he said, I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. Yea, thy law is what? Written within my heart. Good men throughout the Bible have always exalted God's law to a high, high, high position. And Jesus, the only good one among us, came here to magnify the law and to make it honorable. What an idea. So what about New Testament Christians? What about New, New Covenant Christians? When talking about the Sabbath, one man told me, I'm a New Covenant Christian now. But where is the Sabbath located in the law? It's in the very heart of the law. It is the, the part of the law where God's name is found. <laughs> Actually, the Sabbath commandment being right in the heart of the law is the authority that God has to give us the rest of the law. It is his authority. He is the creator of heaven and earth, it says. One man told me one day, well, I'm a new, I'm a new covenant Christian now, inferring that the Sabbath of creation was old covenant. I guess because it has its origins in the Old Testament, but really it had its origins in the creation week, no less. It was given long before Moses. In fact, it was given before the ceremonial laws came into existence, which were a reminder of the Savior to come. When the Sabbath was first instituted, nobody had sinned. It was a celebration to worship our God, right? But what will a new covenant Christian look like? What will a new covenant Christian look like? Let's turn to it. It's Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, starting with verse 15. 
Hebrews 10, starting with verse 15. Notice, notice the Holy Spirit's involvement with all of this. Where of the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. That's what a new covenant Christian looks like. God's law written in the heart. He didn't intend for them to remain written on tables of stone, right? They're, Steve, they're design law, right? <laughs> That's how we are designed. If we jump on, off of a roof, what happens? The laws of God take, take effect, don't they? Design laws. We're meant to stay here on the world, probably. <laughs> design law. Find that same kind of a passage in Hebrews 8, 10, and 11. No one can trample on God's holy law without grieving Jesus. Matthew 5, 17 to 19 says, Think not, Jesus is talking here in the Sermon on the Mount. Think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not just come to destroy, but to what? Fulfill. Fill the law with meaning. Fulfill. So what is the relationship between law and grace? No one who appreciate, appreciates the grace of God will speak ill of God's law. But what is, what is the relationship? And it's stated very simply in Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10. And this is probably all we need to say about this. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. The relationship between grace and the law. Notice what it says. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is what? Yes. A gift. <laughs> when somebody gives, you, gives us a gift, we want to reach in our pocket and pay for it, right? We don't like to accept gifts. I don't know why that is. Because I guess it's because everything that we do, everything that we do, we have to pay for, right? When the electric bill comes, we pay for it. When you buy a car, you pay for it. When you buy a house, you pay for it. Pay, 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 pay. But grace is different than that. Verse 9. Not of works, lest any man boast. But then notice verse 10. Here's the relationship between grace and the law. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works. Good works. He first said here that good works don't save us, right? And then he says that we are saved to what? Good works. Good works are the fruit of giving our hearts to Jesus. Then we'll want to run the way of God's commandments. It's a, it's a root, fruit relationship. Jesus is the root of our salvation, right? And the fruit is the wonderful, the wonderful, loving attributes that the law presents to us. We don't want to steal from people. We love them too much. If we love God, no, Jesus boiled it down to two commandments, didn't he? He said, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy might, with all thy strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. He boiled it down to two. But they're really, that's really a summary of the Ten Commandments. For example, if we love God supremely, we'll have no other gods before him, right? We will not make graven images. We will not take his name in vain. And we'll keep Sabbath holy. That's our love to God, because he's the creator, right? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to good works, which God hath or before ordained that we should walk in them. We're saved from something to something. We're saved to good works. What do good works entail? All those wonderful attributes that are in Christ's character. He wants us to be more and more like Jesus every day, right? We are saved from our sins by grace through faith, not by works lest we boast. But notice something here. One of the purposes in the gospel is to, cre good, is to create good works in us. These good works are the fruit of faith, the evidence that we have been with Jesus. This is why we can be saved by grace and judged by our works. The works are the evidence that we've been with Jesus. It's a, it's a fruit relationship. We are saved from sin to good works. 
and is for our good always so that we can witness to others. Our good works are the fruit of giving our lives to Jesus every day. In the morning, give your heart to him. Make that your very first work. Make that, you know, I say this to the ones who were baptized today. Make this your first work when you get up in the morning. Your day will go a whole lot better. We're not accepted by our good works. They never reach that high bar, yet we are saved to good works. We die to the old, live to the new, as the Holy Spirit teaches us, convicts us of sin, empowers us to witness. The great definition of love is found in, in, in uh, Romans chapter 13. This is the best definition I love I've ever read. It's Romans chapter 13, verses 8 to 10. I invite you to follow along with me. Verse 8, Romans 13, 8 to 10. It says, Owe no man anything, but to what? Love. love one another. That's causes church unity, right? We want a united church. Love one another. For he that loves another has fulfilled the what? Law. law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, you shall not kill. We know now what law he's talking about here, right? You shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there be any other commandment, and there are other commandments in the Ten Commandments, and if there be other, any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love no, works no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is a principle. You don't change principles, right? Policies change, but, but God's law never changes. That's the definition of love that we've been given in the Bible. Love takes on all kinds of forms, right? But usually it's some kind of a policy and somebody says, I love you, and then takes his gun out and shoots him, okay? That's not love. Policy just changed, right? But God's love never changes. Love is the most powerful force in the universe. So salvation comes to us in two packages, two gifts. First, the righteousness of Christ, his perfect life, which he gives to us as a gift in justification. We're declared righteous before the law on the basis of his perfect living, his perfect suffering and dying. And then, number two, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why does the Holy Spirit come into the heart of the believer? He cleans us up, right? He convicts us of sin. He carves this away and that away, those things that are unlike Jesus, so that we can witness for him in the marketplace and wherever we are. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, plants love in our hearts. Love is power. Jesus once said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. And he says also, my commandments are not grievous. It's not a grievous thing to love Jesus, right? And when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, willful sin will be abhorrent to us. More and more as we see ourselves, the closer we come to Jesus, the more faulty we will appear in our own eyes. And with every advanced step, our repentance will do what? It'll deepen. More and more we become sensitive to God's ways and to our sins. You know what? Jesus is coming. He wants to develop a people who are zealous of what? Good works. We read that in the scripture reading this morning. The unconscious sins come more and more to light as we see our sinfulness and we confess them and he forgives them and he cleanses us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to do what? Forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that neat? That's what he does. He's preparing a people to go to heaven who will live in the company of the holy angels. This is why, why it's so important. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime, becoming more and more like Jesus every day, and wonder of wonders. All the while we are under the, the influence of the Holy Spirit, that rainbow of justification is over us. And he looks at us as though we had never sinned. I can't wrap a tongue, my tongue around that. That is so great, so wonderful. He looks at us as though we've never sinned. Today we celebrate that new life in Christ. As we observe a baptism.
joy in heaven over one sinner that repents and enters his kingdom. And a baptism is really a replay of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I would like to just read a couple of texts in closing here. If we could turn to Romans. Romans, the fourth chapter. This is what baptism is. Romans, the fourth chapter. Let's read verses 3 to 6. What says the scripture? Abraham did what? Believe, Believe God. A number of times in the Bible, the, in the, 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 the Philippian jailer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and what? You'll be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever what? Believe. Believeth in him. Bible belief is putting our faith and trust in him. It's a reckless abandonment of ourselves and giving ourselves to Jesus. Faith, that's what faith is. By faith, Noah, what did he do? Was he idle? He built an ark for the saving of people. Faith is an action word. It's a verb. In this case, it's, an, it's not, a, not a noun, but a verb. But all the while, God considers us righteous on the basis of his doing and suffering. Verse 4. But to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Wait a minute, I'm in the wrong chapter here. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Verse 3 <laughs> of, chapter, of chapter 6. I said chapter 4. Sorry about that. Chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Know you not that as many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his what? Death. Death. And we weren't there 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross, were we? There were a few people around there. There were a little group of people over here that says in the, one of the Gospels that they, they sat there and they looked at him. It didn't make any much of an impression on him, but there were some people at the foot of the cross that day who were probably shedding a lot of tears. Verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we were planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his what? Resurrection. Resurrection. We have the, when, when Jesus resurrected from the grave, he had a new life, right? New body, new life. He went back to heaven after 50 days, 40 days. Went back to heaven in a glorified body. We talked this morning about justification, sanctification of the Holy Spirit, and what? Glorification when he comes. This is what we have to look forward to. Verse 5 again, if we have been planted together in the likeness of death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, and the body and sin might be destroyed, that hereafter we should not serve sin. And then a little later it says, sin shall not have what? Dominion over you. We have a new life now. I don't live here anymore. And this all happened when Jesus dies on the cross, buried, comes up in a new life, and we, and it's a symbol, baptism is a symbol of that new life we have in Christ. Actually, we can celebrate the resurrection every day as we live that new life in Christ. What an idea. Celebrate the resurrection every day. It's just wonderful to even to, to contemplate it. And one more text, Acts 2.38. This was uh, in the Pentecostal sermon of Peter. Acts 2, verse 38. <clears throat> How many people were baptized that day? 3,000 baptized on that day. What an amazing thing. Acts 2, verse 38. You know, I don't know how they pulled that off, do you? I don't know where they did that. Did they go down to Jordan? I don't think it's revealed to us. But uh, 3,000 were baptized that day. Then Peter, verse 38. Acts 2, verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized how many of you? Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins or forgiveness of sins. And ye shall do what? 
you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Believe it. Baptism is a symbol of baptism by water, of the death, burial, and resurrection, and, the, and baptism of the Spirit. We believe that the Holy Spirit, uh, from, on the basis of this text and some others, that one who gives their hearts to Jesus has the Holy Spirit. Believe it. <laughs> if somebody comes and asks you, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? What do you say? Yes. Indeed. And what is the evidence that the Holy Spirit is in your life? You know, obedience is probably a desire to be obedient to God. If you love me, keep my commandments. It's probably the greatest evidence that we have the Holy Spirit in our life. What an idea. So, what a wonderful arrangement is salvation. Even the great God could not have created a better plan. May we learn to love it, understand it, more and more until the first perfect day. Mm -hmm.